I have just performed for you the Mazurka Op. 68, Number no. 3, composed by Frédéric Chopin in 1830. My lecture recital is entitled Rethinking the Nationalism in Chopin's Mazurkas. According to Richard Taruskin, when we think of nationalism in Western culture at the second half of the 19th century, it often characterizes a reaction against the supremacy of Austro-German culture. In particular, we note the emancipation of such countries, especially those from Eastern Europe, such as Hungary, Poland, Bohemia, and also from Scandinavia. My lecture recital focuses on Chopin and his homeland Poland. Chopin's name has long been a symbol of nationalism in Western art music. And amongst his compositions, the genre of mazurka plays a special part. One of his earliest mazurkas dates from 1825, when Chopin was barely 15 years old. And interestingly, some scholars agree that one of his last compositions is the Mazurka in F minor, Op. 68, No. 4, which has been dated as late as 1849, the year of Chopin's death. This slide shows something of the importance of the Mazurka to Chopin, as it was a genre he returned to throughout his life. The next slide presents some basic biographical information about Chopin. The red segment represents the amount of time Chopin lived in Poland, from March 1810 to November 1830. The blue segment shows his time in France, which spanned from November 1831 until his death in October 1849. The tiny white piece in between shows the time he sojourned away from either. We can clearly see that Chopin spent half of his life in each place. Let's now ask ourselves how the conception of nationalism relates to Chopin as a composer, and later, how it is displayed in his mazurkas. There are three main reasons why Chopin's biography was constructed as that of a national composer. First and foremostly, Poland was struggling for a national identity. This happened because the nation lost its independence to Russia, Austria, and Prussia, or later German Empire, in particular between 1830 and 1918. The search for a Polish identity also covered Western art music, as well as other aspects of culture. Secondly, let's remind ourselves of Chopin's stature as a Polish composer whilst in exile in France. As we know from the work of Jim Sampson, Chopin is a composer who was cherished by Warsaw, the capital of Poland, and despite living in Paris, arguably the music capital of Europe at the time, he still composed in the Polish national spirit. This makes Chopin a perfect piece of the national identity puzzle. Finally, amidst Chopin's musical style, we could detect several Polish folk elements. Although they are well integrated into his works, we find traces of them in works like the three on this slide. Rondo à la Mazure, Opus 5. Fantasy on Polish Airs, Opus 13. Rondo à la Krakowiak, Opus 14. However, it is in his mazurkas that these folk elements are most obviously and imaginatively used. Let's now look at the mazurkas in more detail. What folk materials does Chopin use? How authentic are these materials? Do they belong exclusively to Polish folk music? And finally, do they transform the mazurka as a genre? The word mazurka designates a dance originating from the Mazovia region of Poland. Here you can see Mazovia within the map of Poland. On this slide are the three dances that themselves are combined to make a mazurka, one of which is called mazur, one is oberek, and the final one is kujawiak. These dances are different in tempo and character, but somehow used interchangeably. As Stephen Downs explains, by the time we get to Chopin, a typical mazurka is written in triple time, it possesses a distinctive dotted rhythm and has accents on the weaker beats. We also know from Jim Sampson and Adam Zamoyski that Chopin 
in letters to his parents, wrote about his first contact with Mazurkas during the summer visits to Mazovia in 1824 and 25. I agree with both Jim Sampson and Barbara Bilepsky that there are essentially two folk elements in Chopin's Mazurkas. The first of those is the use of the sharpened fourth degree of the scale, which we sometimes refer to as the Lydian mode. I'll demonstrate that to you by playing the first part of Opus 68, number 2, in the first section of the piece which is in A minor, the sharpened fourth degree is D sharp instead of D natural, and in the C major phrase afterwards you will hear bright F sharps standing out to replace F naturals. This feature also exists in the third mazurka of this Op. 68 set, which you heard at the very beginning. Its trio section is written in B-flat major, therefore the normative E-flaps will become E-naturals. you notice in the trio section of Op. 68 number 3, in the left hand, there is a continuity of perfect fifths which creates a drone-like effect. And this is the second folk element in Chopin's Mazurkas. Let's also hear how these perfect fifths are used in another work, Op. 6 number 2. Now, we need to ask ourselves where these folk materials come from. On one hand, scholars like Marcelli Antoni Schultz and Arthur Hedley claim that Chopin quoted these folk materials directly from his real-life contact with peasants during the summer visits to Mazovia. But in opposition to this, Belo Bordok and later Barbara Milepsky refute these claims. On this slide, I have extracted something of Bordock's essay published in 1920, where he made a bold claim that, no wonder, then, that composers like Chopin and Liszt, who could not go around collecting these authentic peasant tunes themselves, probably had no opportunity of hearing the genuine peasant or folk music at any time. Perhaps they never came into contact with the peasant classes, or they only heard those popular art songs which had been appropriated by these peasants. I believe we need to examine Bordock's view more closely. He criticises the folkness more like a quality associated with Chopin's music, rather than investigates the musical materials. Bordock's view was influenced by his activities as a collector of Eastern European folk tunes, in which he was helped by the advent of the phonograph. Bordock bases his argument upon the perceived oral difference between his collections and the music labelled peasant music by Chopin or Liszt, which hardly share any resemblance. Besides, there are no records of Bordock encountering authentic Polish folk music, notwithstanding it's possible to assume that his evaluation is still valid. 
Nearly 80 years later, under more meticulous research into musical materials, Milepsi confirmed Wardok's doubt as she declared that it was the myth of the folk. On this slide are the two Schubert biographers who began this myth, Marceli Antoni Schutz and Maurizio Garasowski. And this belief was propagated during the 20th century through the works of such scholars as Zygisław Jachimetsky and Maurice Brown. Whilst I'll agree with Milewski that what Chopin probably heard was popular art music with added folk elements, which was in fact widespread throughout Poland during that time, I still think this argument needs to be refined. We know from her article that these two elements were first introduced by Polish composers at the turn of the 19th century to evoke Polish folk colour for the sake of Polishness construction. However, Milewski does not, or perhaps cannot, trace the origin of these elements. This is nonetheless understandable, as she acknowledges that there are no surviving recordings of authentic folk tunes back then. At this point, we can say there are two possibilities. The first one is, popular art composers simply made up these elements and labelled them a feature of Polish folk music. Milewski seems to have only explored this one. Let's consider the way these tunes were collected. They were transcribed in a manner that was not able to incorporate all of the musical features, such as pitch inflections and tempo flexibility. Also, there was certainly an element of subjectivity in the collecting of these materials. Collectors could have modified the tunes to their own taste, or enlarged the volume of their collections by generating similar sounding melodies. The process of transcription often runs contrary to the authenticity of the material itself. Traditional mazurkas as danced in Mazovia were indeed performed on traditional instruments. Therefore, the process of transcription for more modern instruments meant that the music was inevitably distorted. This opens up another possibility. What if the sharpened fourth degree and the fifth drones have actually been the genuine mosaic from folk music, coexisting alongside other authentic folk features? However, since these two elements sound the most distinctive to the collector's ears, the other features were eventually left out during the process of transcription, and as a result, popular art music later subconsciously drew upon these two elements to preserve the folk colour. Anyhow, let's consider whether these musical gestures in fact belong exclusively to Polish folk music. Here's the opening of Raimonda's Variation from Alexander Glazunov's ballet Raimonda from 1898. Let's forget that this ballet is set in Hungary, which is located to the east of Western Europe. Now, let's compare that with Chopin's Opus 7, number 1, and we'll play the whole mazurka so that you will be struck more by the atmosphere of the section I want to emphasize, of which score will be highlighted on the slide.
we can hear a similar exotic-like atmosphere thanks to the use of sharpened fourth degree in a minor key. In Chopin's Opus 7 No. 1, the sotto voce perfect fifths also contribute to this feeling of exoticism. Here is some more ballet music, this time from a number entitled Mazurka, designed to be choreographed for the whole corps de ballet in Copelia, set to music by Leo de Lippe and premiered in 1870. <laughs> Now, does that have anything in common with the following excerpt from Chopin's Opus 56, number 2? I'm sure you must have noticed a striking resemblance between these two, especially when we encounter the perfect fifth drones, a folk element in Chopin's Mazurkas. After Chopin, the Mazurka became a more popular genre and was no longer limited to Polish composers. We can find Mazurkas in solo piano works by Dvořák or in individual numbers of 19th century ballets particularly Coppelia by De Lippe or Swan Lake by Tchaikovsky. However, is it the folk materials or Chopin's personal musical language that transformed the mazurka? Most recently, Jonathan Bellman has suggested that Chopin's music remains accessible to a wide audience. He claims that it is Chopin's earlier experience with vocal music, especially through printed scores to which he had access in Warsaw, that shaped his distinctive style. We also know from Samson and Zamoyski that Chopin attended a huge number of live opera performances throughout his life. Regarding Mazurka as a dance, Bellman writes, Dance music was lovely and lively, beloved of audiences, because dance is an elemental art form, fundamentally rooted in the body, the music that accompanies and evokes it is usually among the most popular. Therefore, I think it's more accurate to say the use of these folk materials, as well as Chopin's own musical voice, that worked together to transform the mazurka. So to conclude, let's rethink the nationalism in Chopin's mazurkas. Let's remind ourselves that the folk elements first might have been a signature of the traditional peasant dance, but were integrated by Chopin into his mazurkas as a musical gesture. Then, later in the second half of the 19th century, these elements, somehow with coincidence, were employed by other composers to evoke more exotic scenarios outside the conventional Western Europe. 
Let's listen to the final composition of Chopin's life, the Mazurka Op. 68, Number no. 4, and compare with the ones you have previously heard in this lecture recital. We can say that Chopin did an incredible job of transforming the genre. Mazurka went beyond a middle-brow Polish folk dance to become a crucial part of his career, which possesses his quintessence. And together with Chopin's stature, Poland became an impeccable local of the Romantic era. Let's now consider the nationalism in Chopin's mazurkas. It seems that he treated Mazurka more like a compositional tour and definitely with more focus than Polonaise, Ballade or Nocturne. Chopin used it to exploit and express his artistic language rather than a temporal space only to fill with his Polishness. This could be proved by the fact that not all of his Mazurkas contain folk elements. We should also make it clear that Chopin is a highly celebrated Polish composer with a bespoke musical style, not someone who hailed folk music as the goal of his life. To conclude, I will now play for you Chopin's Mazurka Op. 24 No. 2. This work includes the folk elements in a more subtle way, but on top of it, it is written in Chopin's unmistakable style. Thank you very much for your attention. I hope you have enjoyed my lecture recital.